maybe just to inform you, uh, we are now live on YouTube. So that has worked. And Mary, we can also see you now. Yes, yes. I okay. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll wait um, until 10 a.m. Uh, before explaining a little bit about the technical issues of the webinar. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it is uh, 10 a.m. now. I think it makes sense, as long as we are still waiting for people to join, to start with the more organizational side of the event. So let me begin with quickly introducing myself. My name is Sina Marx. I'm a project coordinator at the German NGO Femnet. And I would like to also welcome my colleague Jana Borkenhang, who will be helping us with the technical side of this event. Um, Jana, would you maybe start to explain to everyone the way this webinar will work technically, how they can participate and ask questions and all of this? Yes, welcome from my side. My name is Jana Borkenhagen. I also work for Femnet. I'm here today to support the technical side of the webinar and also to manage your questions. So as a first information to all of you, the webinar is recorded and also streamed live on YouTube so that you are informed, but your names are not revealed as long as you are not mentioning your names when you um, have the contribution later. Coming to this, you are, as participants, you're all muted because we await a huge number of participants. We are very happy about this. Still, we try to allow some participation from your side as well, and this will be done in the following way. When we have the um, the contributions from the speakers today, you will be able to send questions of understanding in written through the button that is called F&A or Q&A that you find at the very bottom of your Zoom meeting. It shows two speaking bubbles. There you can put in your written question that has to do with understanding. We 
cannot address all of them, but we try after each talk to address one to two questions in order to clarify that you can also follow the talks. Further, you have the opportunity to always participate in the chat box. That is also a function you find at the bottom of the meeting. There we ask you to share general statements or maybe you have another link or some information. You can send this there to all other participants. And we will also allow some participation in speaking. And this we will do at the very end. There we will allow an open discussion and for you to participate in that, you can use the button that is the hand raising function, the digital one. You find this next to your name when you click on the participants list. So you just click it and then we will organize it and see who we can unmute. So then you can bring your participation um, in inward. And um, if you wish not to be mentioned by name, when you have a question, then please say so before. So we are sure that everyone is happy. Okay, that's from my side so far. Um, thank you, Zina. Okay, thanks so much, Jana. Um, so yeah, maybe just to add to that, both the recording and the presentation will also be available afterwards. Those of you who have registered online, also those who have been declined because the webinar was already full and who are listening in on YouTube now will receive an email with all information afterwards. Um, for those of you who haven't registered, you can find uh, the, uh, the recording of the webinar also on the Femnet YouTube channel. Um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know us yet, I will give you a very brief introduction to who Femnet is. Uh, what we're doing and how we came to organize this webinar today, um, where we're still waiting for the last people to join us in the webinar. So let me share with you a little presentation. Um, that I'm going to start. Okay, so... Um, well, Femnet is a member-based women's rights association based in Germany. We have been founded in 2007 and we work for the economic, social and cultural rights of women worldwide with a special focus on garment workers. Um, and we are a member of the King Clothes campaign. Uh, the CCC is a global network that brings together more than 230 organizations dedicated to improving working conditions and to empowering, empowering workers in the global garment sector. Also, the three other organizations who are on the panel today are member or partner of the King Clothes campaign. Um, and this is also what we are doing at Femnet. Um, we are campaigning a lot uh, towards improving workers' rights. We do advocacy work in different uh, platforms and initiatives. We do education and counseling at universities in uh, public speeches in schools and so on. And um, importantly, we do solidarity projects together with our partner organizations in the production countries. So we do joint projects and campaigns uh, with partner organizations in Bangladesh and India. And all three organizations that are on the panel today, um, we have been working with them uh, for many years and do joint projects on uh, different topics, mainly on women's rights and labor rights. Um, so also it was that them, it was through them that we first came to know about the desperate situation of garment workers in India and Bangladesh in this time of crisis. Um, but before we will start talking about the impact of the corona pandemic on garment workers, let me begin with saying a few words about why we chose this day today for this webinar. Um, it was exactly seven years ago today that the Rana Plaza complex collapsed, burying thousands of workers under rubble, killing more than 1,100 workers and leaving more than 2,000 injured, many of them for a lifetime. Um, ever since, workers, labor rights uh, organizations, unions and activists worldwide uh, come together on this very day to commemorate the victims of this tragedy and to raise awareness for workers' rights to prevent another tragedy. 
So it is today the first time since seven years that none of us actually can go to the streets to raise awareness for workers' rights on this 24th of April. Um, so I'm very happy to see so many familiar names, but also unfamiliar names on the participant list. And of course, as well, our great speakers on the panel today. So we are really happy to see that so many people are interested in this webinar, um, that actually the webinar was fully booked and we had to live stream on YouTube because so many of you out there want to show that you have not forgotten garment workers and you're interested in um, their fates today in this uh, crisis. So seven years after Rana Plaza, we have come here today to discuss how we can prevent the corona pandemic from becoming the next tragedy for garment workers worldwide. Um, therefore, I would really like to thank our speakers for being here today, despite the difficult times that they and the workers they represent are facing. So let me welcome them and quickly introduce them to you. Um, first of all, Kapuna Akte, she's the founder and executive director of the Bangladesh Center for Workers Solidarity, BCWS. She has been a key player in urging Western brands to sign on to the Bangladesh Accord following the Rana Plaza collapse in 2013. She began working herself in garment factories age 12 and since the year 2000 has devoted herself to trade union work and activism for garment workers in the country. For her tireless fight towards improving the lives of garment workers, she was awarded the Human Rights Watches Award for Extraordinary Activism. Um, Kalpuna, thanks so much for being here today. It's really good to have you on the panel. Um, let me go to Deepika. Deepika Rao is Program Director at the Bangalore-based NGO Sividap, which works to ensure that businesses comply with national and international standards of human rights and labor rights. With this objective, CVDAP studies the effects of corporate activities on uh, communities and also educates workers about their rights. Uh, CVDAP is mainly active in the garments, electronics and leather manufacturing industries in South India. Uh, Deepika has conducted several research studies on women and migrant workers in the garment industry, also together with Femnet. So really glad to have you here today, Deepika. Um, Mary Vijakula is executive director of SAFE, an NGO in the federal state of Tamil Nadu, also in southern India. She is program director of the Labor Resource Center, which facilitates numerous trainings, counselings, awareness raising programs to educate workers about their rights. And Mary, for more than 15 years now, has been fighting against rights violations, uh, especially of women and children in Tamil Nadu spinning mills and factories. Welcome, Mary, great to have you here as well. And last but not least, Dr. Gisela Burkhardt is founder and chairwoman of the, the German NGO Femnet. Femnet is a member-based women's rights association, like I just said, and Gisela is representing Femnet in various initiatives to improve working conditions in the sector, including the German Clean Clothes Campaign and the German initiative that strives for legislation for human rights in businesses, the so-called uh, mandatory human rights due diligence. She is also a member of the steering committee of the German Textile Partnership, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative uh, whose private sector members make up for about half of the German textile market. So she can also provide the consumer countries perspective uh, welcome Gisela and thank you also for initiating this webinar. So you see that we have a very interesting panel and that it will be difficult to give each of our speakers enough time to explain the situation in their respective country. Therefore, let, let us start right away with a look at the country in which the 24th of April became a date of tragic fame, which is Bangladesh. And I would uh, just give you a brief um, overview of the garment industry in Bangladesh, which has more than 4 million garment workers and garments make up about 80% of the country's export earnings with about, well, it's difficult to say, but uh, more than 4,000 factories in the country. So we see that uh, the garment industry is extremely important to Bangladesh, uh, which is the second largest exporter of garments after China. So with the current corona pandemic, um, Kalpona, maybe you can talk a little bit about the impact of the pand pandemic. And uh, when we look at the impact, 
whether we actually see yet another tragedy for workers unfolding in front of us. Um, yeah, the floor is yours, thanks. Thank you, Gina, and you know, very happy to be joining this webinar. And the situation, you know, uh, soon as the pandemic out, outbreaks, we were in a fear that what would be happening to our workers. And, uh, you know, from the second week of March, our workers started to get affected by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic as the brand started the canceling orders. Uh, those was for uh, in March and April, which was already in the place and the workers are making those production. And the brands and retailers, they say they will be not able to receive all these product. Uh, and many of them came with a demand that they want to have a, a 30 to 50% discount. So which is definitely not done at this moment. The brand couldn't show their uh, corporate social responsibility, rather they were like very strict to canceling and not to pay the, uh, the manufacturers for this product. And what impact that our workers are facing out of that, the wages for March 2020 has not been even paid fully till today. So like uh, five days ago, we can say 90% of factory or three days ago, 90% of factories has been paid workers, but it's still, a 10% or you know, less than 10% factory workers yet not paid. And here, the life is that practical that no money is no food. So workers in here are too fear about losing their job. The workers, our workers are feared to get infected by this virus. Our workers are very fear not to have their wages uh, as they have been experienced in this month that the manufacturers are not ready with their payment, even they worked. And for month of April, while all factories was closed, they really don't know that whether uh, they will be get paid in next month or not. So this is, you know, how the uh, how our workers are getting affected by this COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, Till now, uh, more than 70% factory, they already has been laid off. They announced laid off. The maybe, you know, other country has a different version of their law, but in our version of law says, if factories are laid off, workers will still have job, but they will not get paid full month wages. That would be like 60% of that wages they will get, which is not enough for workers. And it also says that workers, those are working less than a year, um, you know, for that factory, regardless how long they're working in the industry. If they work less than a year, they will not get anything during the later period. And later period can be, uh, 30 to 60 days. So that's, you know, just think about that. If workers do not have money, what they will be, you know, eating. And soon as uh, the brand started canceling the order, the factories also started firing workers, especially the workers, those are working, those are in a provisional period or those are working less than a year. And without, you know, these workers, uh, just fired without severances. So they doesn't have money. And these workers will not get job anywhere in next few months or until things become normal. And none of us you know, knows that when, the, when this pandemic will lift up and when things will, our lives will be in a normal situation. So we just mean these, these workers will be starving in next few days if the manufacturers don't reinstate them or if government do not take them under the bailout system. So, you know, the consequences of this pandemic, I know that we all are in this and in this, uh, but if we, if we talk about the consequences of the pandemic, how it is for brands and how it is for manufacturers and how it is for workers, for manufacturers, they will be losing fraction of their profit, even if it is goes for a few months. The manufacturers, they will be losing their profit share, but not their establishment. But workers, it is very practical for them. They will be losing the job and they will have no money and no money means no food. Yeah. Thanks Kapuna for this insight. Um, I have one question because there were so many different numbers out there. 
Um, so, for example, the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association, BGMEA, stated that around 90% of garment workers received their wages for March. But at the same time, other sources report very different numbers. And what we hear from you is also that workers are protesting because they did not receive their wages. So do you have any more detailed information on that? Yeah, I, so as as I said that, you know, the workers, uh, like over 90% workers uh, got paid or over 90% factory has been paid workers, but that is just two days ago or one day ago. So workers supposed to get paid by the first week of this month, the first week of April, but, you know, that has not been done. So, the you know, when workers came uh, in, when a workers was forced to bring in the town uh, to work despite this pandemic and despite the you know uh, higher fear of getting infected the factory has been shut down by on on april 5th but haven't given any exact date that when worker will get paid their wages so a few days later the first date has given that workers will be get paid by 16th, which did not happen. Then the second date was the workers will get paid on 20th. But you know, the workers hadn't had money. They need to buy their grocery. Usually they buy their grocery on dead, okay? So when they get wages, they pay the local grocery shop and then get food again. But this time they couldn't pay on time. So workers haven't had money and their rental, you know, uh, landlords, they were pressing them to pay the rent, you know, their rents. So uh, the workers become frustrated and they were they were start protesting in the street, though they know that there is a high, you know, possibility to get infected, but they hadn't had choice when they're starving and when their children are starving at home, they thought that it is better to protest until they protest, they will not get wages. Mm -hmm. So they started protesting constantly. And then the factory start paying uh, and the last, even even today, you know, workers are getting wages. Uh, two days ago, worker was protesting in the street or in front of the factory to get wages. So when we say number, like 90% uh, factory has been paid, that is not beginning of the month. That is just two days ago. But it's still many workers yet to get paid for their month, you know, wages of March. Okay, thank you for that information. Um, I was also interested because, um, I mean, BCWS and Femnet together are doing a project on gender-based violence and we uh, are mainly working on women's rights in the garment sector. So I was wondering whether you can talk a little bit about um, how women are especially affected by uh, the crisis now. I think Kalpona is muted. Uh, I'm unmuted now. Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> so yeah, the project we are you know running with Femnet is called Multi Stakeholder uh, Project, and we are together working on to prevent the gender-based violent, uh, violence at workplace here in Bangladeshi government sector and government factories. So we are planning to have uh, you know anti harassment committees in the factory and also uh, lobby and uh, you know have a new law and also uh, lobby with government to ratify ILO Convention C190. So it all was we are doing and we are educating our workers uh, uh, about you know raising their voice against this gender based violence. And uh, one of the bigger chunk of work we did under this project that to break the ice because the cultural taboo never give a chance to our workers to speak up or women to speak up about the violence as they've been facing in their factory, in their community and in the commute. But this, this project was helping us enormously, uh, you know, uh, bringing these women voice in the front line and they started to speak up. So when we had this, you know, imp you know, uh, chance and getting our women voice to hear, but we are in the same time facing this pandemic, and this pandemic has been increased the uh, the women's, you know, the different kind of violence, like uh, the violence in their, uh, which we can say domestic violence, like they are now more more exposed to their husband or partners at home. I mean, more time they're spending together. So when they're spending time together, and in the same time, when they don't have stability in their life, like they don't know when they will get wages, they don't know that uh, whether they will have food for next day or not, 
to the tension grows and these tensions being uh, you know more violence towards to women so uh, first of all you know in the bangladeshi government factories you know that majority of them are female workers and uh, this when we say that the workers have been paid which is mean that majority of these women workers are not being paid so the violence they're they're now uh, facing two kinds of um, problem one is that econ uh, instability of the uh, economic instability which just mean uh, doesn't have money to buy food and you know protect themselves or uh, pay for uh, medical but in the same time they're facing the domestic violence as well so this this is the situation of our women at this moment Thanks so much for um, reporting, Kalpona. Um, I think if there is no direct questions from the audience now in terms of understanding, then I would uh, hand over to Deepika. Um, Jana, I think there is, no, I see one. There's one question yes. that came in and it says, I was wondering whether there is an increase of mouth guard production what material are they made of? Is the material less healthy than normal clothes textiles? And under what condition do women have to work? How are they protected from the virus? Kapoor, you're muted. Yeah. yeah. So you mean uh, the personal protection equipment, right? Exactly. It says mouth okay. guard production and yeah, yeah, what materials exactly. Okay, so we, we don't have much idea about the materials uh, because, you know, we all are working from home. But uh, as I know that they, this, these folks, I mean, I really don't want it to, I really do want it to say that the workers, those are making this PPE, they're definitely hero because they are making this for our frontline responders in Bangladesh and in other countries as well. Uh, making these goods. I don't have any uh, idea what is what are the materials are because we cannot see them directly. But uh, as I heard that uh, the factories are um, keeping that, uh, you know, quality. So it is not hard to our frontline responder like doc doctors and the healthcare workers uh, to expose to the virus. So uh, I think they're, they're using very good materials because our doctors also I uh, started using those personal uh, protection equipment. And in terms of that, how these workers are being protected when they're working in that factory, um, I mean, I haven't seen, but what I we heard, uh, you know, through cross-checking, when we also raise our concern that our workers, our women workers need to be protected as well when they're working. So some of the factory has been reorganized, uh, you know, putting workers uh, uh, you know, keeping the distance in between, whatever the distance they're supposed to maintain, they're working in that way uh, as not all the factory, like if one factory has 2000 worker, not necessarily that 2000 workers are making the PPE, it is, you know, less than 30% workers are working uh, or, or, you know, 20%, uh, sorry, 40% working on to making personal protection equipment. So there is a distance maintaining and protecting them but you know, if you ask me that, do I have a first-hand information? Difficult to say for this moment when we are working from home. Thank you. There's another question we got. It says, if most workers got paid now for the month of March, will they get any salary in May for April, although they did not work? Uh, that's a very good question. Okay, so uh, we were, we were, uh, you know. Um, in a difficult situation to get answer to that as well. But in the last last month, in the very last week of last month in March, the government announced a bailout money for export-oriented factory workers, which is like half a billion dollars, um, or half a, half a billion euros, I should say. So that bailout money, first we thought it's an incentive, but lately we come out came to know that it is not incentive. It's a very low interest loan that factory will get, uh, you know, fact factory has to apply for and factory has to, uh, you know, submit workers wages list and also workers bank account, then the bank directly will send that uh, money to the workers, you know, bank account. So that was the, you know, understanding. Then factories, you know, started doing the laid off 
So uh, when factories started doing the laid off, the government came with another another announcement that that factory those has been laid off, they will be not get access to this fund. You know, as a labor activist, I would say it's a very good decision the government has been taken because we don't want our factory to laid off. We want you know our workers to get their full month of wages. So answer to the answer to the your question that whether workers will get paid for uh, this month in the first week of May. Uh, we are trying our best. We are working with the manufacturers. We are working with the government, and we are hoping that the workers will get paid. But very clear message we will get end of this month or very first two three days of you know next month that whether workers are going to get paid or not. But we definitely will use uh, you know all our best communication with the government with the manufacturers to make sure uh, you know to our workers uh, get paid. And from your part of the world, I think you also ask the branded retailers that they have to make sure that our workers get paid for this month, uh, even the factory was closed. Thank Thanks you. so much, Kapuna. Um, I think we would hand over now to Deepika um, to also hear about what is happening in India. Um, I'm going to share Deepika's presentation, and Deepika, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sina. Uh, good morning to everyone present. Um, I would just quickly take you all through the situation in India, the political situation uh, in response to coronavirus, and uh, the effect that has had on the on the textile industry and uh, and its workers and what uh, CVDEP and uh, some of our local partners have been involved in the relief efforts. Um, yeah, the so um, the country the these figures are from this morning uh, that we have uh, twenty three thousand uh, cases and over seven hundred deaths. Um, uh, the country has been under a month long uh, lockdown um, uh, and since 24th of March. Um, and we are currently in the second phase of the of a, of a lockdown, uh, which will extend up to 3rd May, um, with restrictions likely to be eased up in places which, which have um, a lesser number of cases. Um, and uh, what the lockdown has looked like is basically that only essential services have been allowed to operate, like uh, manufacturing, uh, transport and sale of medicines, um, uh, groceries and uh, fuel and other essential items. Uh, and other than that, all, all basically all industries other than uh, probably the medical, uh, in the medical industries, uh, media professionals and the police, everything else was shut down on 24th of March with very, very little notice. Um, and, and you can see from the pictures that it has, uh, it has uh, what, what it looks like is deserted uh, roads and, uh, and a large number of uh, police personnel present uh, on the streets to enforce uh, the lockdown. Next slide. Um, yeah, so uh, what the, um, the, the lockdown has also been marked with is thousands of workers, migrant workers have come to the streets and have uh, started, to make, started to make their way back home immediately as soon as the lockdown was announced. Because there were no public uh, transport uh, present, uh, there was no public transport functioning. Um, and they were forced to make the journey on foot of, uh, and the journey was like it's it's for several hundred kilometers from their destination states like uh, and cities like Delhi, Mumbai, back to uh, villages uh, in different uh, states. Um, and and what what mostly what what accounts of migrant workers have said what drove them out of these cities is uh, one is the fear of contracting the virus because they lived in very congested quarters uh, 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 and accommodations. Um, and and the second was also that when there was a sudden um, clamp down on their income, the daily wage that they otherwise earned by uh, by either uh, selling uh, street uh, by street vending or by doing odd jobs, daily wage, um, driving of rickshaws, construction work, so many workers depended on uh, daily wage, and that wage when that stopped, 
uh, they 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 just found it un unviable to continue living in the city and sought uh, familiarity in their hometowns and villages. Um, so so this this has been really uh, the the story across India uh, where several workers several several thousand workers uh, decided to make their way back uh, to familiarity and comfort uh, in the times of crisis. Uh, with very little food and water uh, and uh, children and uh, 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 along with them on the way. Um, when we come to the textile industry, the next slide, please. Um, in the textile industry, it's, it's the second largest employer in uh, India after agriculture and it employs over 100 million uh, people uh, directly or indirectly. Um, and the industry itself is made up of many uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises. And these these are the enterprises which have been the worst hit by the uh, by the supply chain disruptions uh, that have uh, uh, ha happened uh, internationally as well as within the country because of the virus spread. Um, and uh, there have been uh, there has been a sudden drop in demand uh, internationally and and the national lockdown and so a complete stop on transportation of goods and people. Uh, so the, these micro, small, and medium enterprises are the ones which have been uh, disproportionately hit, and some, by some sources, uh, maybe more than a fourth of them may not reopen once the lockdown uh, is lifted, uh, and um, up to 10 million uh, jobs might be lost in the garment and textile industry. Um, how the industry, uh, government, and the industry has responded. Uh, government has appealed to the industry to uh, not lay off workers and uh, to um, uh, not not cut salaries, but the industry has uh, in turn uh, uh, turned around and asked the government for help in paying wages because uh, they cannot pay wages in the face of cancelling orders, cancelling international orders, uh, fallen uh, domestic demand as well as international demand, and uh, such a huge uh, large scale disruption of uh, of uh, the supply chains. Um, the government has also responded by uh, li likely push for uh, labor law changes like uh, uh, pushing for uh, making it legal to have 12-hour uh, workdays, uh, which of course the, the straight trade unions have strongly uh, protested against. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, the the situation in Bangalore. So Bangalore, the situation is uh, slightly easing up now, with uh, some factories getting back to work. Um, uh, they are working. They've been allowed to work with uh, fifty up to fifty percent uh, capacity, while maintaining uh, all uh, uh, safety and hygiene uh, requirements. Um, uh, if we look at the workers, the workers, many of them have been paid for the month of uh, March, uh, but uh, some of them we continue to, uh, Government Labor Union continues to track uh, the situation um, that many of them continue to be still unpaid. Uh, the, the workers who have been paid have only been paid for the works, uh, for the work, uh, for the days that they uh, that they worked and not for the days that uh, they did not work. So, so we fear the worst for uh, the 50, uh, the the, the entire month of April uh, that uh, the workers haven't worked at the factory. Um, there is, uh, workers are, the garment workers were already very, very uh, precarious uh, uh, workers uh, with, uh, with low wages and long hours uh, and unstable contracts. And uh, this, the, and, and they had their own, and, and they had, they come with vulnerabilities of gender with, uh, in Bangalore, 80% of them being uh, women and, uh, 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 and their migrant status also adding to their vulnerability. And the spread of this virus has really uh, deepened these, these uh, insecurities and vulnerabilities. And uh, uh, if they are called to work, there is a very deep uh, fear that they will contract the virus and then they will go on to infect their uh, families as well. And then how do they deal with uh, uh, the medical requirements that, uh, that, that, that the disease brings with, with uh, the treatment of the disease requires. Uh, and if they don't go to work, then there is uh, the fear of job loss. Um, and, and literally, there is a very, very little saving or practically no saving to fall back on um, uh, at, at, uh, in times such as these. Um, like Kalpona already mentioned that there, we are also seeing witnessing a spike in domestic violence cases being reported to the union. Uh, there, is, there is a need for urgent uh, 
uh, health awareness to be given out to the workers, uh, making it easier for them to access affordable and nutritious food, uh, because that is really something that the workers are struggling with uh, currently. Um, and and uh, just just uh, try also trying to assuage the fears about job loss because that that is uh, very very uh, real, the fear. Um, a lot of these workers also are come from single uh, single um, headed households where their their incomes are the only ones. Uh, even if there there is another income of their husband, that also comes from another low wage work, uh, which is also as hit if not badly, if not more worse than uh, than garment work uh, has been hit in these times, uh, like construction work or uh, informal um, uh, work such as an electrician or a plumber or uh, um, or, or uh, street vending. So they, and, and they really, they, they, the workers are really facing the, the worst of the brunt of this crisis. Uh, migrant workers, again, the fear, along with all of these fears that uh, all the workers are failing, uh, facing, they also live in very uh, cramped uh, accommodations and there is a risk of, uh, there's a very heightened risk of uh, the virus uh, uh, spread amongst uh, migrant workers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we we are in in the short run. We are trying to uh, provide immediate relief to workers because that is something that is just needed for survival. Uh, help with dry rations, uh, with cash transfers for rent, uh, anything, any support that they may need to stay back in the city uh, and pursue employment when the factories open. Uh, that is something that we are trying to do for workers. Um, we're trying to also may give awareness about about the health uh, uh, precautions that sh they should take, um, and uh, connecting workers also to government relief and support agencies. Uh, for the long term, we are tracking. Uh, we are we are we will be conducting surveys on an ongoing basis to understand uh, the conditions in which workers are trying to cope with the situation. Um, their access to various uh, uh, various uh, schemes and. Uh, uh, entitlements that the government has announced um, and also documenting and analyzing the situation as how as to how exactly uh, is the industry uh, going to uh, um, get back on its feet and also respond to this crisis because this is something that we feel is uh, this will be uh, uh, this will have a very long term effect on the industry itself and the workers uh, we are anticipating uh, uh, job uh, Ma massive job losses uh, or loss in income, um, and and we are trying to see what we can do in uh, trying in in supporting the workers in uh, countering this such situations like legal aid or or uh, just support to stay back uh, in the city of work. Um, uh, that is all from my side. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Deepika. Um, are we having a question, Jana, to Deepika? Yes, there are some questions. We also have some questions from the YouTube chat. For the listeners there, we will address the ones who have been for Bangladesh in the end of um, our discussion. As for now, we have a question on um, payments by mobile phone. Uh, what about workers who do not have mobile payment accounts? Um, in our experience, most most workers have a basic mobile phone. If it is, uh, even if it may not be a smart uh, phone, they have access to a mobile phone account. And this this we uh, we did this just so that they are able to communicate uh, with their families. Uh, they are also able to communicate uh, communicate in case they are looking for jobs, um, uh, if they have lost their jobs, and just to get information on government schemes. So this was something that we felt was very essential, and and that is why uh, and and in our experience, the mobile coverage, mobile access is quite quite uh, widespread amongst workers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then there was another question. This is now also from YouTube. Um, do you have any positive examples of any brands' response to the situation that could be shared to inspire other brands? Um, as of now, we've only seen uh, promises by brands where they have said that they will not uh, uh, cancel orders. Uh, but it's really still early to say this because uh, say whether they will follow through with their promise because 
like i said and uh, you know we have been seeing that workers have been paid uh, most uh, uh, most workers have been paid for the month of march uh, the april month is what is more crucial and 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 what follows after that uh, once the lockdown uh, is eased and uh, uh, workers get back to work um, what follows and and how the the how they are treated after that so we are we still waiting and watching we do not have any uh, instances to share uh, as of now mhm mm thank you um then for there is one other question is there any central support by the state with food packages vouchers that can be accessed from anywhere in the country regarding that some of the migrant workers are not getting to the home villages to make use of the decentral offers yes so uh, the government has been distributing uh, uh, ration through its usual uh, public distribution uh, system the pds system which uh, which even on a normal uh, even during normal times would distribute subsidized food grains Uh, but this was only available for workers who were registered uh, as domicile workers of that state and usually we've seen that migrant workers do not have access to such cards which are required for this but the government in this situation realized that the risk is more for migrant workers and has gone um, uh, gone to some length to make sure that migrant workers are also receiving the food so we we've, we've had quite an active response from the government agencies uh, but the problem is that the demand is too huge um and and we 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 uh, uh and and you know the government machinery uh, is is also slow and bureaucratic at times so so uh, civil society organizations have stepped in in large numbers actually uh, to um, uh, mitigate the crisis for the workers and provide some immediate uh, interim relief um, uh, at least yes thanks so much divika i think that's a good opportunity to actually um hand over to mary to um get a perspective from a different uh, state of india um mary i yeah there is your video maybe you could unmute your microphone and i'm going to uh, share my screen again um yana can we see the presentation in normal mode we see the presentation but it's not in presentation mode okay let me try to fix that mm. now we see the videos again so the presentation is not showing mm -hmm. yeah maybe we can uh, before i show and uh, Uh, solve these technical issues mary you could um also talk about a little bit the migrant workers because i think this is something that in tamil nadu is a um very important issue and maybe you can um explain a little bit what is the difference between the situation in bangalore and in tamil nadu uh, yes good afternoon to one and all um i mean tirupur has a there are two kinds of uh, migrants one is interstate migrants second one intrastate migrants they are coming from other districts of uh, tamil nadu but at present both of them are suffering for uh, food materials or food um government missionary is also taking efforts in the later part to supply the food materials for Uh, interstate migrants and um, uh, intrastate migrants but as you all aware of it the demand is very very high that is why uh, the problem is very huge um, in this cities the the migrants wants two things one the food material they want immediately second thing they are having a lot of uh, uh anxiety to go home these two things are we could see very visibly because since i am in the ground always um related to uh, the wage situations no work no payment until 22nd whoever worked until 19 or 20th uh, of march they have received the wages uh the other days they did not they i mean the during the lockdown period 
no one received wages it is uh, the highest challenge for the workers to um, feed their children or feed their um, uh, feed themselves is uh, the highest challenge uh, since uh, we are getting a lot of calls uh, i mean around every day we get a 200 uh, calls maybe the single calls or uh, the group calls we are getting to provide the food materials we are doing in three ways one is we ourselves are directly distributing the uh, food materials which consist of uh, rice dal lani and potato uh, the washing uh, soap and the protective uh, materials um, these are all the things we are providing them directly second thing we are associating with the government uh, wherever they are doing it we are also partially contributing with the government to distribute as much as possible workers to reach out third we are referring the workers to different uh, helpline number which is existing at present uh, uh, scenario especially for the covid 19 um to reach out and asking some of the helps uh, there are some critical cases uh, they wanted to go home they can get a permission from the administrative office and they can go this provision only for a tamil nadu state because there is no train facilities if any workers wanted to go home i mean others other uh, district then we are guiding them to go and get the token and then they can uh, go for very emergency situations um and there are m as um, deepika mentioned msme is a very worst vulnerable uh, situations i would say everyone is but these are all uh, workers are uh, no no work no payment this is the situation is uh, existing over here the most affected is a uh, contract workers uh, no contractor is ready to support even a small amount of money also no one is ready to uh, give any of the workers they are 100 percentage or i would say 80 to 100 percentage they are depend on any one of the materials from either government are from us uh, that's why it's the, the cruelty is very very uh, high for them okay thanks mary for um this first impression um you also send us some pictures of the relief work that safe is doing um yeah. and maybe i can show some of them and you can comment on them a little bit Uh, to to describe what exactly SAP is doing to support workers in this situation. Okay, the first photograph. I mean, this is in on the scenario um, in the uh, screen. I mean, these are all the workers uh, coming from uh, Andhra state. I mean, neighboring Andhra, Karnataka, uh, uh, these states, even Varissa and Maharashtra. Uh, these are all staying in this. compound there are uh, around 300 uh, uh, 323 per i mean totally 323 persons are in this uh, surroundings which we have started our uh, distribution from this hamlets uh, i mean living pockets next slide uh, this is we are uh, this is another uh, uh, compound you have to see these are all the workers from odisha now the workers are most of the workers are coming from odisha through some of the centers a uh, government uh, training center so these people are calling to that training center asking the help for them um so we are also getting these kind of calls from other district other district 
and other uh, some of the government officials also directing us to go on help this community uh, this is the one of the street where we are uh, supplying the food materials you can see this this is they are staying in the dyeing industry they were called last 3 days they do not have any food even all these children we have got from the call that they do not but they are not able to call they do not have a number also because when the other building opposite, uh, opposite to this there are uh, some building they called us to help uh, these people so we have uh, distributed them now we are going to distribute third time to provide food for them this is the one scenario we could say there are several scenarios like this um these workers are uh, from bihar and west bengal um these workers are now fourth time they are calling again a fourth time we have to go and distribute because uh, they are uh, they do not have even a single money in their uh, uh, pockets to purchase anything though the shop is opened but they are not able to go and purchase anything so completely they are depending on our support one time we are supporting next time the government is coming and uh, we are linking with the government after that also it is not sufficient again we are supporting we are combination of both with the government and ourselves we are uh, doing this services that you can see the children this is the guy uh, without his wife he is uh, uh, in the home they has to take care of this children he does not have any uh, food materials to feed these children mm. this is home wise we are going and uh, distributing it thanks so much mary for sharing this um yana do we have a question for mary yes we have a question that is if you could please explain what type of contract the contract workers have okay. and do the migrants have mobile phones in tamil nadu but maybe this is two different questions so let's first address the type of contract and maybe also the situation of informal workers yes <laughs> thank you i mean uh, the contract workers the all the workers are working in any one of the garment industry but Uh, the payment will not be done by the principal employer they will get from the contractors labor uh, contractor now no labor contractor is picking up the call uh, to uh, support them and some of the contractors labor contractors are already i mean tamil nadu labor contractors are already left to their homes Uh, so they are in the helpless situations the another aspect also i have to say uh, mary can i can i ask one question uh, whether and i understood this right so you say that many of the workers are actually employed through agents and that the agents are the ones to pay uh, for the wages rather than the factories themselves is that right no it is not an agent labor contractors the one contractor have uh, 20 workers or 200 workers or 300 workers so the 200 the labor contractor have to pay the payment for uh, 20 workers or 200 workers or 300 workers uh, the wage the wage he has supposed to get from the uh, uh, principal employer now the principal employer situation he is not able to uh, pay anything since the inception of this uh, lockdown period itself our uh, employer associations openly says and again and again they are reminding the government to pay the lockdown cost for the workers they for, for that they are saying the reason that uh, already both of them Uh, kalpana and uh, deepika told that the shipped uh, goods are not received by any of the retailers or brands 
and the orders also it is been cancelled some of the way so they are calculating all this amount already they are the employees are in the loss of situation so they don't want to pay the lockdown period wages okay thanks so much um so Jana, what was the second question? It was uh, whether Tamil Nadu workers have mobile phones. Is that exactly. right? Yes. Uh, I mean, most of the workers are having the mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you, Mary, very much for your um, report on what you're doing. I mean, it's really important work. Uh, and this is why FemNet also reacted quite quickly when you called out to us and informed us about this situation. You were among the very first to, you know, call out and call for help for the garment workers who were more or less starving. Um, so this is why we established an emergency relief fund for garment workers that also supports the work of SAFE. Yeah. Um, so to those of you who wish to financially contribute and donate for the work of our partners, please go ahead and donate to the Corona Relief Fund. So Gisela, you had the idea to set up this emergency relief fund in order to quickly support workers in this time of crisis. And I mean, of course, the immediate response to workers in need is really important. However, structural changes are also needed to avoid situations in which workers are dependent on charity in the future. So what do you think we in the consumer countries can learn from this crisis in order to work towards such uh, structural improvements? Um, please unmute your mic and I will show some slides you prepared for uh, going into detail on this question. Yes, okay. Oh, thank you so much also to all of you, uh, Deepika, Mary and Carbona for presenting us the situation, explaining us the situation uh, in, in your countries. Um, I, I, I really would like uh, to point out what are, first of all, the consequences of uh, the Corona pandemic and later on our demands. And as Sina said, uh, there is on one hand the actual demand for a relief fund, which we have set up, but for sure what we need to have are structural changes. And uh, we can see really since many years, nothing has happened, very little progress has happened on, on the worker social and economic rights. Uh, we still don't have sufficient high wages even the minimum way of minimum wage is only paid and we all know that this is not sufficient for for survival that's why workers do do overtime in a huge amount uh, but there's also the, uh, what we can see now in this situation there is no social protection Carpona already mentioned it, there is no um, social protection in terms of unemployment schemes or uh, provident fund in India is also only happening to a certain extent. So I think uh, that is something which, which should be a lecture for us that needs to be an improvement or a change in the, in the future. And what we can also see now in this crisis, this is the same also, by the way, in Germany, I think it's mostly women who are suffer the most because they have the, the triple burden. Uh, they are not now locked in, uh, in, their, in the room, sometimes with quite, uh, with husbands violate, violating them. So uh, domestic violence is increasing. We see that everywhere in the world. Um, uh, well, for we have seen in, in Bangladesh that there are quite a lot of billions of orders cancelled by uh, our, our buyers. Um, that uh, is affecting more than uh, well half of the uh, of the working population in the textile factories, and uh, we well we feel that it is really uh, now the time for buyers, German buyers, European buyers, American buyers to show solidarity, and not transfer all the responsibility to the suppliers for sure. 
We, we recently le learned in a Kinsey study uh, that most of the buyers uh, try now to negotiate the conditions uh, of uh, their orders again. The, and more or less 50% of all orders seem to be re renegotiated, which means that they try to get a price reduction or the extension, the time uh, for payment has been extended. There are a lot of ways how they can try to change these uh, orders. And we feel this is not correct because they really have to stick to their old uh, terms and conditions, uh, how they uh, have negotiated the orders in the beginning before co the Corona crisis. Okay, and I think after Corona, uh, it should be made sure really that payment uh, of goods of the goods of this uh, textile closes must cover all uh, all costs, especially living wages necessary to be paid, all types of benefits, social security scheme, the safety, all this should be paid. And there are different models uh, already being discussed. One is uh, to have an additional charge levied on the FOB, on the free on board price, uh, but there are also other measures that can one can think of. And for above all, I feel what we need to have is a rethinking of the business model. We, we can see that there is overproduction in the world, uh, in our world, in the, in the Western world, the clothes can't be uh, weared anymore. It's much too much in the world what we have. And we have, uh, well, all this affects the environment, uh, our earth and the exploitation of, of workers uh, is behind that. And we think why is happening all this if we finally don't wear the clothes and um, if we continue with this type of business model, that has to be changed. Less production needs to be produced, but under fair conditions, healthy conditions, and uh, conserving our our earth so please next slide Sina. so what what does that mean for our demands so first of all what we ask for is that workers income is protected and their health is protected so brands must publicly commit to a responsible sourcing uh, strategy that means that they should also uh, publicly, and that is important that they publicly commit to it and not only saying it or uh, generally in general terms, but have to, to publicly show on their website, for example, that they will pay all the orders completed or in production and uh, that they don't ask for new price negotiations, that they don't cancel their orders, that production times could be extended, for example, and uh, also that if in case of delay that there shouldn't be any sanctions by, uh, by the buyers. Um, okay, payment of wages, as I said, is necessary. Also, severance payments is necessary. And for sure, workers should not be fired. We have learned now that quite a lot of them uh, in Bangladesh, I heard about it at least, have been fired. And finally, the health has to be protected if production takes place. Uh, as far as I know, in Bangladesh, some factories are working. I think in India, only, only very, very few, nearly none of them are working. Uh, and those who work, uh, then they will pr produce special pr um, uh, products for, for uh, clothing uh, for, for the coronavirus. But what we need now, if, the, uh, if for example, the factories start again, uh, so they need to have personal protective, pr uh, protective equipment, uh, they, there must be physical distancing. Uh, so now normally one sewing uh, worker is sitting behind the other. That needs also, there must be created uh, a distance between them. And also on the way to the work as uh, often transport is organized by companies, one need to pay attention of keep distance and, uh, and protect workers' health. Um, and for emergency relief, uh, I think what is really needed apart from we, I mean, we have started as FEMNET a very small fund, 
but for sure the our our possibilities are limited so that what we really need to have is contributions from multilateral institutions donor governments and brands to all finance a kind of relief fund uh, there are already discussions going on. We know that from our German government that they are doing it, and we hope that this is uh, this is really starting soon. Um, so, on a short term, uh, such a relief fund is ne necessary in order to give credits and loans to to provide quick income. But on the long term, we need to have social protection floors for workers. As I said before, unemployment benefits need to be. Uh, build up social security systems. So if the next pandemic comes, the, all the systems are better prepared and, and workers don't need to suffer as they are doing now. And finally, what we need, I think, is all these measures are on a voluntary basis. But what, what is nearly uh, needed is a mandatory human rights due diligence. That means that we need to have a legislation here in Germany, we are discussing, uh, especially the so-called Lieferkettengesetz. So uh, it is necessary that the German government provides a framework, the legal framework for mandatory human use, rights due diligence, and which also includes that uh, factory or buyers can be um, pursued in court in case they are not uh, fulfilling their their um, uh, their, due, their due diligence, and uh, we also would need that at a European level and in other European countries. France already has such a law, uh, but at EU level, it would be great to have. Uh, such uh, such structure. Okay, that's for the moment, I think, very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gisela. Um, Jana, do we have a question directly to Gisela? Yes, there's a question to Gisela. It says, is Femnet actively engaging with brands to not cancel the orders? Yes, we do. Uh, we we do. <laughs> we have written to uh, to especially to um, the members of the German textile partnership. We have asked them and we uh, to publicly also commit and to to announce that they are not cancelling orders. So uh, this we are doing within the German textile partnership. But I think we also um, uh, together with the clean clothes campaign. We will uh, start uh, more and more demanding uh, companies uh, to declare themselves and especially not to stop orders, but to continue with orders and to pay those orders that are already have already be, um, be, be given to the to the suppliers. Thank you. Then we have general questions that came in to all speakers. So to Zina, you decide if we can start the open discussion. Yes, I think actually that question is great to uh, start mm -hmm. and get an uh, idea of a vision kind of, of uh, after Corona. So maybe you can read out that question. Exactly. So we have collected many thanks to all your questions from YouTube and here in the webinar. I would start with a question to Kalpuna. So um, it says that um, the garments are planning to opening after the 26th of April with only 50% of workers. So the question is, what about the rest? And we can also maybe couple this with another question. If it is allowed for factories to lay off workers while the government has ordered a national lockdown, that is supposed to operate legally as a national holiday. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I have seen a few other questions as well regarding the mobile phone and everything. So I'll be uh, responding to all of them together. So, you know, having 50% workers and opening the factory from next week and onward, uh, you know, whatever they do, we definitely want our full workers to get paid from each factory. 
So why they have, you know, why government or BGME says to open with 50% factories? Because many of the workers just left for their village houses. So if they come now, there is a high percentage of them to get, uh, you know, infected by the virus or, you know, getting the virus spread. So that's the reason why it been says with the 50% worker to work now. And especially those are now living in the industrial area, they should be working. But it is so difficult to choose because you know all workers do not work in every section and they are not skilled for every work. So I don't know, it is BGME has to decide or factory has to decide how they will define this 50% worker. But our demand is very clear that it is 30% or 20% worker, it doesn't matter, but our 100% worker has to be get paid. So this is one. And second, when you know the country, the government has been called for a lockdown and that how the factories are uh, you know, doing uh, laid off. I mean, that is definitely, you know, the factories went uh, beyond the government decision. They are not exactly following the government decision, which is like violence, violating the law, of course, okay? So that is why the government is already says that, you know, factory those has been laid off, they will be not getting access to the bailout money, bailout loan money. So I think this is one initial step that government has been taken. But we also heard that while the BGMEA, the Manufacturers Association, submit an application to the government that they wanted to call a, you know, a laid off for a 100% factories, like all factories, they wanted to call a laid off, not a holiday, because holiday will make them pay a full payment and the laid off will make them pay less. So they wanted to call it laid off, but government, we had in a backdoor government said, no, they are not agree with it. So it's still the situation is the government in a position, the factory cannot lay off and they cannot pay. But few of the union, like we are working with them and we already submit a application to the government. There is a level of provisions uh, called 324 to apply that at this moment, if government apply that you know, provision, so the you know, so they can call few provisions that uh, you know makes workers to get uh, fired, retrans, dismiss, terminate. I mean, those provision can be postponed for few months or for time being. Okay, so we have requested government to announce that. So we really don't know that how far it will go, but we are we are back and forth with government. The other, res you know, respond to the, you know, uh, one one had a question that uh, how many workers has bank account or whether all workers got bank account, how you know it will work, how workers wages will be transferred. So. Till uh, yesterday, we have been heard about 2 million workers already have opened the bank account after pandemic, you know, after the virus breakout in the country. So there is a, you know, all of us, the government itself, they are going through the national television asking government, sorry, asking workers to open the bank account. And the opening mobile bank account is not too tough. It is easy. So they can do that. And it is increasing pretty much every day. So workers opening the bank account and submitting to the factory, but few factory making difficult workers life. But like, you know, if workers open the mobile bank, uh, bank account, then factory asking, oh, you need to go XYZ bank and open the bank account up there. But then we are getting into the scene and we are saying, no, no, no. For this moment, you have to work with this. So we are also encouraging our workers to open up the bank account. If, <coughs> If the workers left, you know, yet they have not, uh, you know, opened the account, then, you know, that's a difficult uh, position, um, you know, decide how workers will get wages. But we definitely, uh, you know, ask the manufacturers and government to find a way so our workers at least get payment. So I think these are the questions so far I have seen. Uh, and also I have seen another question, it says that, uh, you know, whether it will be similar kind of production or order will be uh, getting the, uh, our countries will getting after the lockdown or, you know, when situation uh, is normal. I mean, in response to that question, you know, question that um, we really don't know. I mean, it, it will be a different world, I think, uh, where we will be stepping uh, in a few months from now. Uh, maybe the consumer will be more conscious, but in the same time, they will be asking the brands to pay a fair amount of money. So workers, if they even lose job, 
I mean, maybe many of them will be losing job. There will be not same scale of workers that we have. Like we have 4 million, 4.2 million now. Maybe there will be less. But in many cases, our workers, husband and wife, both working in the garment industry, both of them working because one person earning is not enough. But in the coming days, coming months, when pandemic will be not there, if life become normal, maybe consumer choose not to buy fast fashion. Uh, maybe they choose differently. I mean, definitely we want them to choose differently. I mean, fast fashion doesn't help. That kills, you know, many things. That kills uh, our mother, you know, mother earth. I mean, it has, it has been affect many, many ways to us. So we, what we want by a sustainable clothes, but in the same time, pay enough to, and also make sure that when you pay enough, the workers get a fair share of it. If you even pay big, but the brand do not pay enough to the manufacturers and manufacturers do not uh, pay enough to workers, that will not help. So as a consumer, when you are choosing to buy a sustainable clothes, we definitely you want, I mean, we want them to do that, but in the same time, make sure you pay enough and that share, you know, fair share goes to the worker. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have answered lots of questions, that is fantastic. We have some more that I would address to Deepika maybe. There is um, an eager interest to understand what kind of labor contract exists and how is the percentage of labor leasing and what is the situation with the contractors? What is their control considering to the, to the workers and how much percentage do they receive from the salary of the workers? Just maybe give us some context. Mm. So, so Bangalore is um, uh, a lot more, the, the garment industry here is a lot more formalized than it is in uh, Delhi and in Tirupur. So we see uh, mostly large factories over here, which uh, form the first tier of uh, the fast fashion uh, industry. Uh, so it's, it's, it, we mostly seen permanent uh, contracts, permanent worker contracts, but now also an increasing trend towards um, uh, uh, leaning towards contracting, subcontracting uh, and piece rate workers. Uh, so the large chunk of workers, women workers are directly employed by factories. Um, and these factories, uh, like, like I shared before, it, it's a mixed uh, that some of them have paid, some of them have paid the entire salaries, some of them have only paid for the days that they work. Um, the smaller factories, uh, factories which are not under so much uh, scrutiny, uh, 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 probably will uh, escape under the radar by not paying uh, the entire wages and not paying any wages for April. Uh, contractors, we have seen, uh, we've heard this from uh, uh, across industries, not just garment industry, but across industries that contractors are just not reachable to workers. Right at the time when they need, uh, when the workers need them to be there and support them in an alien city, uh, contractors are missing and uh, it's it's i mean they 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 haven't heard from their own uh, uh, paymasters so contractors are missing and they they are not able to respond to uh, demands of the workers for uh, for wages or for uh, food relief or any of it uh, daily uh, peace rate workers and home workers of course uh, they they i don't think they even expect uh, any any relief uh, from uh, their employers uh, so th that situation yeah, but the situation in, in Tamil Nadu is different. So I think Mary should probably better be able to answer to that question. Mary? Mary, then yeah, yeah. please share your insights with us. Yes. Uh, in um, uh, Tirupur, uh, around 30 to 40 percentage only are the direct employment in the factories. The rest of them all either piece rate or contract uh, under the contractors. Particularly, the interstate migrants are, I would say around 80% are under the uh, contract either or in the piece rate system. That is why the challenge is also very huge. But Mary, how much, uh, uh, if a contractor uh, now is paying uh, the worker, how much does he keep for himself when he gets this, the money from the factory? Um, I'm not sure exactly how much. Sure, he will take it uh, from 20% to 30%. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you very much. Then we have another question that is about the um, communication channels and strategies in Bangladesh for COVID-19 crisis management. What are the communication channels for the crisis management in Bangladesh? This goes to Kalpuna. Kalpuna, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> ah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, understand the question. What is the communication challenge you mean? Yes, the question says, could you name some communication channels and strategies in Bangladesh for COVID-19 crisis management? So not challenges, but channels, like I guess how the government is communicating to the population, things like that. Oh, okay. So, yeah, the communication channels. So our prime minister comes to, uh, you know, the television, the national television, which is broadcast like pretty much every, every uh, channels. Uh, she talks live with all the administrators, uh, you know, the district administrators. And through that, you know, we also come to know that what are the government uh, packages, what government, you know, announcing. Uh, but if if we talk about whether we are getting, like rather than prime minister, uh, whether we are getting very clear information from other ministry as well, like uh, especially from health ministry, no, there is a re real difficulties that we get from the health ministry, like in terms of information. Most of the time we really don't know that, um, though they do everything like pretty much every day in the middle of the day, it says that how many person has been tested and how many uh, new positive patient has been found, how many death has been done. But people has a distrust with that uh, information and people has a very angry, uh, you know, people are very angry, including me, because it's a very minimum test happening. Like a day, it is 3,000 maximum people getting tested. Uh, 3,000 plus we have just seen yesterday. So um, we are not getting a clear information why uh, it is happening, whether it is inadequate kits or it, is there any strategy for that? So this is one difficulty that we are being facing. The government says that the government, you know, the information they're disseminating by the television that uh, the country is ready with all the medical support uh, for the victims, uh, you know, those are facing the virus uh, who need medicals. But the reality is different. Like when we are here, the people's story uh, who was in the hospital, they're, they're saying a difficult, different stories to, uh, to the media, to the social media. So these are like, you know, the communication is, uh, you know, it's difficult up there. And it, in terms of, uh, you know, the food dissemination, like there is a lot of people, like daily laborers, they're facing a lot of problems because they don't have income, they need food. Uh, they need relief uh, and uh, food bags right away. Uh, the government is saying that they're disseminating a lot of foods, but people uh, through the television, we come to know that, you know, the people are not getting uh, that uh, properly or the proper distribution not happening. So that, uh, and, and yeah, so this is like difficult way uh, with the difficulties that our people are uh, facing. And one other difficulty that we are facing that, you know, uh, working from home, it is very new, uh, new, new thing for Bangladesh. Uh, we are really facing a lot of challenges. Like internet is slow. We don't know that how to do that. We don't know. Uh, many of us not you know experienced to uh, ordering or you know online food like online grocery. Maybe we did online you know uh, order for food like very ready food, but uh, groceries or medicine those wasn't like very common in the country. So those are the challenges that we are being facing, and it is very uh, practical uh, problem for challenge for our workers as well because they use most is phone, not the internet. So they are facing the you know communication challenges as well. And uh, in terms of reaching out to the government with many issues, it is challenged because we always used to give them a manually like application. We, we used to go to their offices, submit the application, 
uh, getting a stamp on it, but now we are sending over email, but we really don't, I mean, we are not getting very quick response for them. We need to call them like few other time. So these are like challenges we are, we are coming, facing. Thank you very much. We have one question to directed to Gisela. How do you combine the reduction of production with the demand for not canceling orders now? What will happen to clothes produced now and not sold? Okay, there I would like, uh, I would think one needs to, to, um, to, dif to differentiate between uh, first reaction and long-term reaction. I think I think on the short term, short term, uh, for sure, all this production is already there, so that needs to be somehow sold, and that's why I think uh, it is it is absolutely necessary that buyers have to uh, to 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 take the clothes that they have ordered and pay for it accordingly. And uh, on the long run, we need to discuss how the uh, type of uh, how the amount of clothes can be reduced and should be produced more on a sustainable way. Also, as Kalpuna has pointed out, I think in order to save our mother earth and to uh, to have better working conditions. And I would like also uh, because we because we are I see at the time that we are coming now to, to probably to the end. Um, I would like to state once again the responsibility from, from the buyer side uh, and would like to mention uh, some um, recent uh, statements that have been uh, produced. One is uh, a statement which has been issued by the German Partnership for Sustainable Textiles together with other multi-stakeholder initiatives. It's called Responding Responsibly to the COVID-19 Crisis. Uh, it is a kind of declaration where uh, buyers are, um, are, are asked uh, to, to have a, a responsible purchasing practice. It's not a, um, a kind of um, direct commitment by the brands, although this might come in a, in a second stage. And there is another paper which has now come out by, um, by Industry All uh, and uh, some, some trade, trade unions as well as with, especially with big uh, companies, most of them organized in, in the ACT, who maybe some of you know about the ACT. So it's called COVID-19 Action in the Global Garment Industry. And there, at least, uh, it is said brands and retailers commit to paying manufacturers for finished goods and goods in production. So if companies sign this, they will commit themselves to, to pay for these finished goods and goods in production. However, I also would like to mention here, nothing is mentioned about whether prices have been negotiated again or not. And I feel that is a must. Uh, because we know that nearly by, by McKinsey report, <laughs> it was interesting to, to learn that most of, about 50% of all buyers started renegotiating prices with the suppliers. So what I feel what is necessary, we need to have a commitment by brands in which they say they will take the pre finished goods and production and those in production, but to the conditions agreed upon uh, in, in the beginning and not renegotiated again. And finally, a last, uh, uh, last paper I would like to mention, which is probably not very much known yet by most of you, that is a paper from the civil society, or it's called the Civil Society European Strategy for Sustainable Textiles, Garments, Leather, and Footwear. And it is issued by more than 50 or 60 NGOs. It's a call on the EU to contribute to the upcoming comprehensive EU strategy for textiles in 2021. Uh, and it comprises a lot of themes and issues. And I feel this is a very good opportunity for us as NGOs to, uh, to push the EU and to ask for other type of production, to look into the environment and to look into uh, social uh, issues. So that one is coming up and I would like to, to everybody, we can make it public later on and uh, or send you the link to the, to the paper. And uh, if others would like to sign, the more we are, the better. So thank you so much for that.
Thanks a lot, Gisela. Um, and you're absolutely right. With a look at the time, uh, we have to slowly come to an end. Um, I would just wanted to point out one more um, thing to you, which is the live blog by the Clean Clothes campaign for everyone who wants to stay tuned um, and who would like to uh, know about uh, more about uh, the issue. Okay, I have to put on presentation mode. Thanks, Diana, for telling me. So this is the link to the blog of the Clean Clothes campaign. It's a live blog on how the coronavirus influences workers in the supply chains. So for all of you who want to learn more about um, the situation of workers in the production countries, please follow this blog. It will uh, show you um, all the news that you need to know. Um, so yes, let me just finish here by saying that uh, Rana Plaza was a so-called wake-up call um, to the garment industry uh, since people all over the world asked brands and retailers as well as governments to work towards better safety for garment workers. So I think now let all of us work together um, to make sure that this crisis will be a wake-up call to work towards a transformation in garment supply chains that directly benefits workers, that makes sure that brands pay up to workers so that workers will no longer pay the price for a structural crisis of the fashion industry and that this industry will never again leave workers so unprotected. So thanks a lot to everyone who participated uh, and of course especially to our speakers today. Um, Thanks so much for your inputs and it was really interesting uh, listening to you. Um, take care and of course stay healthy. Um, we will also be updating uh, our followers on Facebook and Instagram and via our newsletter about um, what CVDEP, BCWS and SAFE will be doing in the coming weeks. So thanks a lot and also thanks a lot to the people on YouTube uh, I'm very happy that this worked out. It was uh, the first time for us with all these technical issues. I was surprised that uh, with streams from th three different countries and uh, participants from all over the world, this worked out so well. Um, so yes, thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kapuna, Deepika, and Mary. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Gisela. Thanks, Zina and Anna. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.